Well, good afternoon from Washington, D.C. Uh, good morning if you're on the West Coast or indeed good evening if you're watching us from Europe today. My name is Ryan Bourne. I occupy the R. Evan Scharf Chair for the Public Understanding of Economics here at the Cato Institute. And I'm really delighted to welcome you to this uh, Cato Institute book forum on the, de on the Data Detective, the new U.S. release by economist and commentator Tim Harford which is in fact the American release of Tim's book that was first published in the UK, titled How to Make the World Add Up. I think we're in for a real treat today. Uh, but before I introduce Tim, I just want to go through a few housekeeping rules for those of you who are new to Cato Book Forums. Our author is going to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes before we go into a moderated q and I'm the moderator. Uh, I select the questions and I will present them to Tim uh, as I see fit, and you can submit them today through a vast array of different platforms. Uh, so if you're on Twitter, Facebook, uh, the, the Slido box accompanying the video on the Cato website, I believe you can even submit from YouTube too, so you're spoilt for choice. So please do get involved with the conversation today. For those of you who don't know Tim, uh, he's a fellow Brit, but more pertinently, an accomplished economics writer and commentator. At the moment, Tim writes a regular column for the Financial Times newspaper and hosts the BBC's excellent more or less radio show, which you can access from the US as a podcast. And it's a, it's a great show that investigates the accuracy of information and statistics out there in the public domain. It's always a fascinating listen and, and in truth does so much more than that, really getting to the bottom of some of the thorniest debates over data. Of course, Tim is an accomplished author too, his undercover economist book has, according to the Amazon page, and Tim can, can verify this statistic and, and how uh, whether it's still accurate, has sold over one million copies worldwide. And perhaps most gratifying for Tim, that in part led him to receive the Bastiat Prize from our friends at the Libertarian Reason Foundation in 2007. And I believe he, he also was awarded that prize jointly in 2010. In a world in, in which statistics are increasingly weaponized and uh, selectively used for tribal purposes, Tim is a data skeptic in the true kind of desirable sense of the word. He comes at information with questions, doubts, uh, and reservations, always seeking to put numbers into context and exploring their true signific significance. And this new book, The Data Detective, really tries to impart the wisdom he's accumulated through uh, hosting his radio show and also in his writings, to inform us how we, as consumers of statistics, should approach them through 10 simple lessons. Now, Tim is superbly placed to do this, and you don't need to take my word for it. He's an honorary fellow of the Royal Statistical Society in the UK, and he comes to us by royal appointment, having been awarded an OBE in the Queen's Honours List for Services to Improving Economic Understanding. So, Tim, welcome to Cato. It's great to have you with us. It's a fantastic book, which I've got a copy uh, with me here. And the floor is yours for some opening remarks. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, it's, it's great to be back at Cato uh, in as much as you know, anybody is at Cato right now. Uh, my uh, very fond memories of attending events, learning uh, at the Institute, and, uh, and even giving one or two talks there myself. I uh, used to live in Washington, D.C. My oldest daughter was born in D.C. She's an American citizen. Uh, and so I'm really honoured to be invited back. So obviously, my previous behaviour has not disbarred me. So I'm very glad about that. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Ryan, for chairing. So I wanted to start with a little story because I like telling stories and uh, they can often teach us about the world in a different way. And the story I wanted to tell, I think, hints at what might be slightly different about The Data Detective to uh, the many other books out there, many very good books out there about how to think about statistics. The story starts in 1937 when uh, an art critic called Abraham Gradius was approached at his Monaco villa by a pillar of the Dutch establishment called uh, Gerard Boone. Now, uh, Bradius was the world's leading scholar on Dutch interiors, Rembrandt, Vermeer, these great painters. 
And uh, Gerard Boone was a former member of parliament, a committed anti-fascist. Uh, and Gerard Boone brought Bradius uh, a parcel and a story. And the story was of a, a family of anti-fascists in Mussolini's Italy who uh, feared persecution, who wanted to escape to America, land of the free, and they had to raise money to do so. And they had something that they thought might be of value. But was it really of value or not? Uh, only Abraham Bradius had the expertise to judge. And so Bradius and Gerard Boone opened this package that Boone had brought with him out of Italy. And inside it was a painting still stretched over the original 17th century stretcher. The painting depicted the Jesus Christ at Emmaus, about to reveal his divinity to the disciples. And in the corner of the painting were the magical initials, I V Mare, Johannes Vermeer. But was it genuine? Was this really an undiscovered Vermeer? Only Bradius really had the expertise to tell. And he wrote about the discovery of this painting in a magazine, uh, the Burlington. He said, when I was first shown this picture, I had difficulty controlling my emotions. We have here not only a masterpiece, but the masterpiece of Johannes Vermeer of Delft. It's a very interesting phrase. I had difficulty controlling my emotions. That basically was the problem. You see, the painting was a rotten fraud. Of course, the painting was a rotten fraud. You could see where this story is going. And somehow, Bradius had been taken in. Uh, but when you look at the painting, and you can, you can look up Christ at Emmaus, uh, it's, it's not a very good painting. It doesn't look like a Vermeer. Vermeer is a master. I mean, you, know, you may well be able to summon to mind an image of uh, the woman in blue reading a letter, holding her breath, maybe pregnant as she stands in the, the light of a window, looking down. She's catching her breath, waiting for news, and we're catching our breath too. Or, or the milkmaid, or girl with a pearl earring, the, the Dutch Mona Lisa. I mean, he was an absolute master of light and character and storytelling. And this painting is just not very good. There's a, there's a sort of funny bit at the front where the the disciple's arm is kind of leaning on the table and it seems to be detached at the elbow. It's like a fake arm has been clamped onto the table. So why would Abraham Bradius, the world's greatest scholar of Vermeer, make a mistake confronted with this not particularly good forgery? Well, that I think is the question. He said, I had difficulty controlling my emotion. And that's what I wanted to understand. You see, it turns out that wishful thinking is incredibly powerful in governing what we choose to believe and disbelieve. There's a lovely little story uh, done here in Oxford, a little story, a lovely little study of this done here in Oxford uh, by an economist called Guy Mayraz, who uh, asked, got people into his laboratory and he asked them to make forecasts of uh, what he said was the price of wheat. He showed them these graphs, uh, sort of jerked up and down, like these sort of, you know, the Dow Jones kind of graphs. And he said, okay, this is the price of wheat. Tell me what you think is going to happen next to the price of wheat. And he offered them a cash prize, small cash prize, if their forecasts were correct. But he also divided them into two groups. So half of them chosen at random, he said, you guys are uh, your bakers. And if the price of wheat goes up, you're you'll lose money because wheat is an input. And so if the price of wheat goes down, I'll give you an, a second cash bonus. Uh, the other half, they were the farmers. And so if the price of wheat was high, the farmers did well. And they would get a cash bonus if the price of wheat was high. So you've got these two things you're paying these people to, to do. One is you're paying them to make an accurate forecast. And the second is completely random. They've got no control over it. If the price of wheat happens to move in their direction, they get extra money. 
what Guy Mayraz found was that people forecast what it was they wanted to happen. So the farmers got extra money if the price of wheat went up, and they forecast that the price of wheat would go up, and the bakers got money if the price of wheat went down, and they forecast that the price of wheat went down. This is wishful thinking in its purest form. And wishful thinking really influenced what Abraham Bradius uh, was, was doing and was believing when he saw this forgery. He was an old man. He uh, would have loved to have discovered before he died one more Vermeer. Uh, he, he had certain theories about Vermeer as well. There are certain mysterious gaps in Vermeer's painting career. And Bradius had this idea that, that there would be a certain kind of painting that would fill those gaps. And this particular forgery perfectly fit Bradius's theory. So he wasn't just being shown a, 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 an ostensible Vermeer. He was being shown proof that he'd been right his whole life. He was being shown vindication. That's a very, very powerful thing. Now, you may be starting to get a sense of why it is that in a book about statistics, I begin with a story about an art forgery. Because it turns out when you look, just look around, what we believe and what we disbelieve is hugely influenced by our desires, by our preconceptions, by our pet theories, uh, by the in crowd, by the out crowd. We, we're emotional creatures. We have filters, we have biases. And while there are many, many good books out there explaining how a completely dispassionate person should think about statistics in order to avoid making technical mistakes, we are not completely dispassionate people. And if Abraham Bradius, the world's leading expert, could make a mistake because his emotions led him astray. Well, that's really the first thing that I wanted to address in my book. Uh, and, it, and you might say, well, how could, or you might ask, how could such an expert be fooled by so crude a forgery? And it's partly that his expertise gave him extra ammunition to reach the conclusion that he already wanted to reach. So, for example, the fact that it was on an original 17th century stretcher, he could see that. It was on an original 17th century canvas. He could see that as well. The forger had scraped off the original painting and, and repainted over it. He could see that it had a 17th century antique in the painting. Remember, it's a painting of biblical times. So it's a bit weird to have a 17th century jug in a biblical painting, but that's the sort of anachronism that speaks of authenticity. Of course, the forger knew this and he'd stuck the 17th century jug in there. There are all sorts of other things, countless little clues that you or I wouldn't have noticed. We would just have looked at the painting and gone, not very good, is it? But Abraham Radius, he saw all these tiny things and they were enough reason to ignore the one big thing which is that the painting doesn't look like anything Vermeer has ever painted. So, the story has an interesting twist. The forger himself was caught, not because anybody pointed out the forgery, but through a, a combination of recklessness and bad luck. At the end of the war in Europe in 1945, he was arrested and accused of selling a Vermeer to a Nazi, and not just any Nazi, to Hitler's right-hand man, Hermann Goering. And this forger, a man called Han van Meegeren, was put in the extraordinary position of having to avoid a firing squad by demonstrating that he hadn't committed treason by selling a Vermeer to the Nazis. He had instead committed forgery by selling a van Meegeren to the Nazis. And with this an extraordinary circus, the whole kind of fraud uh, unraveled and it was discovered that the painting that had been sent to, to Bradius and various other paintings had all been painted by Van Meegeren. But really the, the story of Van Meegeren stands in for, for the story of the forgery itself because I've read lots of biographies of Van Meegeren, heard lots of stories about Van Meegeren. I first heard the story 40 years ago when I was a boy. And most of them make him out to be this clever, misunderstood trickster, the guy who gave the Nazis a poke in the eye. But actually, if you read an up-to-date 
biography. Uh, I, I would recommend Jonathan Lopez's book, The Man Who Sold Vermeers. Uh, you, you discover that, um, oh, sorry, The Man Who Made Vermeers. You discover that Van Meegeren uh, was not this charming guy at all. He was an active Nazi. He was pals with Nazis. He held uh, you know, lavish sex parties in Amsterdam at a time when people were starving in the streets. You don't get to do that unless you're friends with Nazis. The whole country is under Nazi occupation. And he even created a book full of anti-Semitic poetry and, and drawings, lavishly produced, and uh, sent it to Adolf Hitler with the, uh, the dedication to my beloved Fuhrer in admiration, Han van Meegeren. Now you'd think to yourself, how, how, how is it that people could regard such a man as a hero if only that book had been discovered, in, discovered in Hitler's library, if only they'd known when they took him to court, when they convicted him of forgery, when he left the courtroom, being cheered to the rafters, literally the most popular man in the Netherlands, with one exception, one of the most popular men in the Netherlands, promptly dropped dead. There was talk of putting up a statue. How can this man be a hero if only they had found that book dedicated to Hitler? They would have known. But the truth is, they had found the book. They did know. And Van Meegeren waved it away. He said, oh, the, somebody else must have written that, that uh, dedication. Uh, I suppose in the modern world, he would have said, um, that's not my voice on the tape. Uh, he would probably have dismissed the newspaper that the reported the discovery as, as fake news. You see, we all believe what we want to believe. Uh, Han van Meegeren was a master of giving people what they wanted. He gave Bradius proof that his theories about Vermeer were true, and he gave the Dutch this hero who would stand up to the foreign bullies, to the Nazis, would give Hermann Goering and Adolf Hitler a poke in the eye. And that's what they wanted. And so they believed it, despite the evidence. That's really why I wanted to begin my book with that story. I want to understand the data. I want to understand the numbers. I want to use statistics to illuminate the world. But I realize that there's no point in trying to do any of that unless, first of all, we can stop fooling ourselves. Well, thank you, Tim, for that um, introduction. And, you know, I recognize that a lot of your book was actually written prior to COVID, but so much of it kind of chimes with the experience um, that we're all going through in terms of, you know, the motivated reasoning that we see in the use of uh, very selective statistics with, with COVID. The great value of your book, as, as I read it, is that it kind of really e equips the reader with some um, ways of thinking and rules of thumb so that they can personally avoid kind of falling for that, um, f for those, those errors. So if you were to be asked, you know, what are the most important couple of things that we can do as individuals to avoid kind of that motivated reasoning when we use statistics, you know, what would you say are the most important uh, things that we should try and accomplish? So, well, to boil the 10 rules in the book down to, to a real soundbite, I would go for the three Cs. So calm, context, curiosity. So calm, we've seen the reason for calm. You know, Abraham Bradius, Abraham Bradius lost his cool. He didn't control his emotions. So when, whenever we see a newspaper headline, a post on social media, whatever, we, the, the first thing we should do is just notice our own emotional reaction to it. I'm not saying don't get angry or don't be afraid or don't feel vindicated, but do at least notice that you're having those emotional reactions, which are very common because we humans are emotional beings and also because this stuff is designed to make us emotional. And Twitter thrives on emotion. Facebook thrives on emotion. Cable TV thrives on emotion. Even classical newspaper headlines are supposed to get us interested. Right? So for the first C, calm. Just count to two, count to three, take a deep breath, and then go back and have a look at the, the number again or whatever the claim is. The second C was context. So that covers a huge grab bag of different ideas, but, but what you're really trying to do is to understand what it is that this number is actually saying, what the statistic is describing. So a few questions you might want to ask. Uh, well, is it going up or down? I say it seems so simple, but what is the trend? Very often you see a number that's either 
they're comparing it to last year or maybe a number in isolation and you've got no trend. Without a trend, you haven't really got any context. Or context might be, well, that's the situation in the United States. What's the situation in Europe? How does it compare to Europe? How does it compare to Mexico? Where, what, where, are, where else might we look for some kind of comparison? Or maybe the, the kind of context is, well, this is, a, this is a big sum of money that somebody is proposing to spend. What is it per person? Uh, you know, it doesn't make the, you know, the, the case for a policy, it doesn't make the case against a policy, but it gives you a sense of what is the oomph behind a policy. If it's dollars per person, rather than just dollars spread across over 300 million American citizens, then we're not really understanding the, the sums involved. Um, another really important aspect of context is just to say, well, what, is it, what exactly is being measured here? So very often, let, let me give you a quick example. Um, you might see a newspaper headline that says, uh, scientists have found that uh, playing violent video games uh, doesn't increase violent behavior. It, or maybe that they found that it does increase violent behavior. You don't really understand that study until you know, okay, how do they, what, what's the definition of a violent video game? What's the definition of playing? Did they get people in the lab to play for 10 minutes or did they study people who were playing for 40 hours a week? What's the definition of violent behavior? I mean, is this, are we talking about people getting in trouble with the police or are we talking about somebody filling in a questionnaire? Uh, there are different strengths and weaknesses of any study, but very often all the details of what is actually being done uh, don't make it into the newspaper headline. And in you know, a, a less distinguished newspaper, they, they I write for the Financial Times, which of course always give the context, but they might not even make it into the, the newspaper reporting itself. So I gave you the three C's, calm, context. The last one's curiosity, and you can see the connection. So curiosity is just saying, well, I wanna know what's going on, I want to understand. Uh, above all, I want to use numbers to help me illuminate the world, the, the window into the world, rather than I want to use numbers to make an argument for something. When it's fine to make an argument, it's fine to use numbers in that way, but you have to understand that if that's and the way you approach them, you're making yourself stupider rather than smarter. If we first approach numbers and ask them to help us understand the world, that is the way to use them wisely. Then, okay, fine, you want to change the world, you want to make an argument, that's fine, but I think that should come later. Yeah, quite often I, th I find that the kind of factoids that hang around that are kind of misleading, but on the face of the actual claims true, um, a, a kind of those where you really have to dig deeper into the underlying, you know, what is being measured here that you uh, outlined within the context. And I think a great example of that um, for lib that libertarians might be interested in is the sort of st statistic that you see every year uh, emanating from Oxfam reports on inequality. And you write about this in the book. Um, so one year, I believe it said, you know, 85, the 85 richest people in the world were as wealthy as the bottom half of the population. Just talk us through that example of a way that, you know, you really have to understand what's being measured before you can assess the quality of the claim that. Yeah, it's, I think it's such a fascinating case study for me um, because I, I see those, those numbers come out every year. And the very first thing I have to do is I have to check my emotional response because they make me angry and get annoyed. And I need to go, okay, just calm down because this year it might be, there might be some insight there. But the, so the first thing is we have to understand these numbers were selected for impact rather than illumination. And that's not my speculation. There are um, blog posts on the web, perfectly, you know, they're perfectly transparent about this with Oxfam staff discussing uh, what a great success this was in terms of column inches, headlines, clicks, and so on. It's designed to gain engagement. And the initial, uh, the initial data that, is used to make these claims comes out of a, it's, it's an investment bank, it's Credit Suisse, produce a global wealth report and they produce it every November, I think. And for some reason it takes about eight weeks for Oxfam to crunch the numbers, uh, even though it's, I think it's the work of about half an hour, I would have thought, but it takes them about eight weeks. So they're always able to release their press release just when the World Economic Forum meets in Davos. And it's just coincidence, I'm sure. And, um, the first one, the really, the really breakthrough number was, yeah, 85 billionaires. They, they said, oh, you imagine you could fit them on a double-decker bus, London bus, 85 billionaires between them, 
have got more wealth than the, the poorest half of the world's population. Now, that is true as far as we know. I mean, the data are not particularly high quality, either on total wealth of the poorest half of the world's population or on, you know, it's Forbes is just collecting this data on billionaires. I mean, the, the data aren't that great either way. But what, so what really frustrates me about this claim is I, I immediately leads people into A, an emotional reaction, that's what it's designed to do, and B, into mistakes. You can see the mistakes. So here's a mistake, for example. So the BBC picked up on this and they said, oh, the richest 85 billionaires have got more wealth than the rest of the world's population. Uh, which when you hear it, you go, that's, wasn't that what Oxfam said? Well, the, Oxfam said, the richest 85 billionaires have got more wealth than the poorest half of the world's population. And you have to think, because it's such a, it seems like such a small difference, but actually when you total it all up, the billionaires have got, I think it's about two and a half trillion between them. The poorest half of the world's population have got about two and a half trillion between them. And the rest of the population of the world has got about 300 trillion between them. So you're making a comparison between these two tails uh, of the distribution with all the wealth is actually in the middle. Uh, and again, it's, it is true. And you know, two and a half trillion is a lot of money for only 85 people to have. And it's not a lot of money for half the world's population to have. I don't deny that. But we've immediately sort of missed this huge chunk and people are getting confused. So another newspaper uh, picked it up and said, oh, well, the, wor the world's 1%, the 85 billionaires, have got more money than... Hang on a minute. 85 billionaires are the 1% suddenly. What is the population of the world? 8,500? But you see how quickly you, you move into absurd mistakes because it sort of feels right, like the 1%, they're kind of like the billionaires, aren't they? And where you, well, I, I mean, arithmetic suggests there are 80 million people in the 1%, and so on and so on and so on. And in the book, I actually look at the wealth data and take it all apart and say, well, this is, you know, wealth is very unequally distributed. Um, here's where it is, here's what we know, here's, Here's what's missing from those definitions. For example, um, state pensions not counted as wealth. Private pensions are counted as wealth. Take it all apart, and at the end of it, you go, okay, I, I would hope you go, I understand more about the distribution of the wealth in the world. I, I see that it's very uneven, um, but I also, I think, see a lot more about where the money actually is, who has it, and it, you start answering uh, all sorts of implicit questions about whether there's any policy response you might want. And, you know, in the end, I'm interested in, in illumination. Other people can do the campaigning. They can campaign for whatever they like. I just want to try and understand what's happening. Yeah, I think when I looked at that um, statistic as well, one of the things that kind of struck me is when you look at the um, demographic distribution of the global population, um, I think if you get to around half of the global population, you're pretty close to the kind of median age. And we wouldn't imagine many young people to have much in the way of uh, significant wealth. So there's all sorts of mm -hmm. ways that you can contextualize that statistic that are important. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Although, well, one, should that the, um, one should say that the one should say that the it's actually the adult population rather than so it's the teens. But yeah, it's 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 really really interesting. The, the other thing that that uh, I realized is by looking at wealth rather than income, lots and lots of people have zero or negative wealth. Uh, there aren't many people, very few people have negative income, not many people have zero income, but lots of people have zero wealth. When you add up, you can add up billions of people with zero or negative wealth and you've still got zero. Or negative. So you can start saying things like, uh, my nine-year-old son in his piggy bank has more money than the poorest billion and a half people in the world put together. When you think about it, you go, well, hang on, I haven't really learned anything about your son's wealth and I'm not sure I've learned anything other than a billion and a half times zero is still zero, uh, but it's quite a soundbite. Yeah, and of course, people who uh, graduate from law school with extremely high debts would find themselves at the bottom of that uh, net wealth distribution. Um, I've got a hell of a lot of questions coming in already through our Slido. Um, so this is quite an interesting one. Should we have a standard for the use of adverbs such as soar, skyrockets, collapse, plummet, when we see that they describe um, a certain increase or decrease in a statistic? What kind of rules of thumb might we use in how we describe statistics? 
Oh, I, I love this. I mean, this is uh, Cato. This is this is the the beacon of liberty, and now we want we want to legislate on on how people use the the word "saw." But no, it's a fair point. Uh, in the Financial Times, we do try to steer clear of uh, these sorts of words, partly because they're just they're cliches, they're kind of boring, um, but also because uh, they don't necessarily tell you anything. Um, it's I think it's more informative to give people the information and then let them make their own, uh, draw their own conclusions. I'm sure I violate this rule myself all the time, but trying to pull back a little bit from the editorializing does help. And yeah, what does SOAR mean? What does Skyrocket mean? We, we don't know. Yeah, I remember seeing a statistic actually sometime in the Washington Post where they were describing differences in growth rates between presidents and I think, you know, one growth rate was something like 3.1%. The other growth rate was kind of 2.6%. And and they they claim, you know, it wasn't much difference because uh, if you just look at the change in the, uh, you know, the actual, if you just look at the level in each case, it looks pretty similar on paper. But of course, that small difference in growth rates over a long period of time can have very, very big impact. So again, contextualizing that stuff is incredibly important. Um, I've got another question here. When we're kind of, digging into trying to understand statistics. Let's suppose we've got somebody who has published a report that has a statistic in it. Um, this questioner, Hank Myers, says, um, Microsoft teaches a technique called direct questioning, uh, which as a routine, uh, listeners select a question about a speaker's presentation and then try to drill down three or four more levels on the same topic to really understand it. Now, this throws up some difficulties. It's not a gentle procedure. So are there ways to try and identify weaknesses in statistics or lack of knowledge without offending someone, someone who's obviously you know, quite defensive about the work that they've produced? Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting question. So um, w there is a, a technique I describe in the final chapter of the book or the, the conclusion of the book, um, and it's based on uh, a really one of my favorite psychological studies, which is an exploration of something called the illusion of explanatory depth. And you'll see, you'll be, well, what's this all about? You'll see the connection with, with Microsoft in a moment. So the illusion of explanatory depth begins where you, you ask people, uh, how well do you think you understand how a flush lavatory works or a, or a, a zipper, a zip fastener or a bicycle? And people will generally go, and you say oh, on a scale of one to 10, People are like, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, nine out of 10, eight out of 10, yeah, I know how a flush laboratory works. And then you say, okay, that's great, great, great. I'm glad we found someone who, so here's a pencil and a paper, and a piece of paper, just to just draw some diagrams or just explain it in as much depth as you can. Go, you know, all the bullet points, give us all the details, exactly how it works. And when you do this, people very quickly, tend to bump up against the limits of their knowledge. And they go, oh, actually, I don't know. Like, I don't know why, why when, you, when, why when the water comes out of the cistern into the bowl, why does it all disappear that, around the U-bend? And then why, why does, why, I, I don't know. I actually don't know. And, and this is true for, for most people. And then they will then, they'll, realize they haven't been lying to the, uh, to the experimenter, they've been lying to themselves and they will own up and they'll say, oh gosh, yeah, I know less than I thought. And they'll scale back their, uh, their assessment of their own knowledge. Now it turns out you can do this for politics too. So you can say, oh, okay, so you're, you're in favor of unilateral sanctions against Iran. And um, just explain, so how, how do unilateral sanctions work? I'm not asking you to justify this, just, so how would you impose unilateral sanctions on Iran and how, what would happen? What would the, san would the sanctions be on everything or would they be limited? How, how does it, or a cap and trade system to fight climate change. How does cap and trade actually work? How are the property rights defined? Who gets them? Um, and again and again, you find people realizing, ah, there's this policy that I thought was a great idea or I thought was a terrible idea. And now I realize I don't fully understand what the policy is. So I think there's, that's an, a, a, a way of quite gently puncturing the illusion of knowledge in somebody. Uh, you're simply asking them to explain 
in, in some detail. So there's, there is definitely a connection with the Microsoft method. I find it quite, quite helpful because one of the things, it, it's quite non-confrontational. I mean, obviously you can annoy people with this method, but you're not asking anybody to justify anything. You're just asking them to explain. And so if you're having an argument with somebody about cap and trade and you think they're wrong, you could ask them to explain cap and trade and either they will be able to give you an excellent explanation, in which case you may well get smarter, or they won't be able to explain it, in which case they will get smarter. They will realize the limits of their knowledge. And it turns out when you do this, people tend to moderate their political views. They tend to be, um, have, uh, be less judgmental of people on the opposite side of the political debate. They recognize there are shades of gray. They realize, oh, this person I thought was clearly an idiot is, you know, maybe has a point. So just asking those questions and getting people to explore non-confrontational way of revealing if there are limits in their knowledge and maybe getting them to acknowledge those limits as well, which is that, that's the really trip, uh, difficult thing. I want to shift gears a bit, Tim, because obviously you're first and foremost an economist. I'm an economist. Um, and in the Wall Street Journal a month or so ago, there was actually an article by an economist who was bemoaning how much uh, economics had shifted to people being kind of first and foremost statisticians and, and saying that they're just following the data and that in doing so they were forgetting theory and the kind of mechanisms of cause and effect. That article, um, that in trying to kind of kick off theory and, and just be data driven, I think there are occasions where the profession itself opens itself up to uh, identifying statistics and information and results that back individuals' ideological priors. But then somebody might respond to that, and I know a lot of people do, would counter that it's actually the theorists who tend to be ideological and unwilling to, to shift the theory when the facts don't, don't fit the, um, the theory that we hold. So I just wondered, you know, where do you fall down on that in, in terms of the use of statistics in economics? Does the broadening and, and, and greater use of data in economics exacerbate ideological preconceptions or help mitigate them, do you think? It's a really interesting question. So I read the piece uh, and uh, a very interesting piece. I mean, I personally would recommend the Financial Times over the Wall Street Journal, but still it was a good, it was an interesting piece, but I did, I got the sense of a little bit of straw man argument in that piece. So, so there was this sense of, um, oh, there are, there are uh, these people out there who call themselves economists, who are purely data-driven. They've got no theory whatsoever, uh, no idea of incentives or why incentives might work. Uh, there's, no, um, there's no demand curves or any, there's no price theory behind any of what they do. Uh, they just grab some data. And uh, I, I don't really recognize that description in, in most economists. I mean, maybe Steve Levitt, the author of Freakonomics, was, I'm not, not sure even Steve really does this, but he sometimes says, that he's quite proud of not being a normal economist and you know, driven by the data rather than by theory. But if you look, for example, at uh, the recent winners of the Nobel Memorial uh, Prize in Economics, um, Esther Duflo, Abhijit Banerjee, Michael Kramer, they're pioneers of randomized controlled tri trials in economics. Very clear that you need theory to interpret the result of a, of a randomized controlled trial and figure out what the policy implications of that are. Uh, and so for me, I think, uh, you know, I'm not worried that there's going to be just this uh, completely theory free approach uh, to economics is catching on. Uh, and I generally believe that we should be pleased to see more data. I mean, the great theorists of the past, do you think would go all the way back? I mean, Irving Fisher, John Maynard Keynes, Milton Friedman, uh, uh, Kenneth Arrow didn't have a lot of data to work with. I mean, Irving Fisher was, was a wonderful um, gatherer of data. He pulled together data to try to help inform his theories. And, and Friedman, of course, great statistician uh, or econometrician. But, you know, they didn't have a lot of data to work with. And so when you don't have a lot of data to work with, of course, theory is going to be completely dominant. Um, but we've got more data. We've got better ways of gathering data. We have you know, incredibly rich data sets that can really tell us things uh, about human behavior. And I don't think we should just be saying, well, you know, we shouldn't be looking at the data because the, you know, the data might lead us astray from our, from our beautiful 
uh, is going to come when you're able to combine both. And, and that's what I tend to see in economics. I see a combination of both. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think there are some occasions, though, where, you know, inevitably, when you're looking at the data, you're looking at kind of one aspect, whereas, you know, perhaps if you start from a theoretical perspective, then you might look at other margins of things that could adjust. But I fully accept that, you know, a lot of the work that, that I see done, I think, does incorporate the theory um, as well as, as, as testing the evidence, too. I'm going to ask you a question now, uh, just a, a simple one word uh, answer and then ask a follow up. Um, fact checkers, underrated or overrated? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I, I think slightly overrated by geeks like me. And I'm pushing back against that. That wasn't quite a one word answer, but you asked the follow up and, and may, maybe we'll be able to explore that a bit more. I think they're wonderful. I do think they're wonderful, but I think there are limits to what they do. Because I think they can add real value. And, and, you know, there's a great one in the UK that we're both aware of, uh, full fact. I found some of the American fact checkers a bit more hit and miss. But I think what annoys people with fact checkers a lot of the time is the kind of bias by selection effect. So even though they might be honest and straight down the line, assessing statistics, the choice of things that they choose to assess shows their biases and makes people less likely to use them. So I'll give you an example. You know, there's lots of um, motivated reasoning that we see on issues such as climate change. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of um, people that are very concerned by climate change that make um, outrageous claims as well. You know, we have 10 years to save the planet or calling CO2 driven climate change a kind of existential threat to humanity. And when some people hear that and see that that's perhaps not justified by the science, but isn't called out by fact checking websites, but then uh, claims of kind of lesser significance are, I think people think that fact checkers have an agenda, even though they themselves might be trying to be straight down the line. So, you know, what, what do you think about that difficulty, the kind of bias by selection? And how do you go about not doing that when you're presenting your more or less show? Uh, so it's a very good point. I and mean, it's one of several difficulties that fact checkers face. Uh, so you, by simply by choosing, I mean, the most, the most straightforward example would simply be, well, if we, if we just fact check uh, Republicans and we never fact check Democrats or vice versa. Uh, you know, we never fact check. Never, if we never fact check any Republicans, we will never catch a Republican in a lie, uh, or vice versa. So that's an issue. And there are certain topics that are more amenable to uh, fact checking simply because you've got more data. You can say more straightforward, you know, more you know, clearer things. But there are also topics that are, uh, you know, more politically sensitive or, or not. So I think that's an issue. Second issue is. Um, how does the fact checker choose to present the results? It is perfectly possible with a, 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 the wrong kind of fact checking to actually amplify the result, uh, amplify the lie. Um, so just to give you an example, and they don't do this anymore, they, they've got smarter about it, but um, a prominent uh, right-wing politician in the US, uh, UK, Nigel Farage, said a few years ago uh, that Malmo was the rape capital of Europe. And it, it's not, but uh, the way the BBC reported that was a fact check. Is Malmo the rape capital of Europe? You can click on that headline, and then great big headline uh, is, is Malmo the rape capital of Europe? Then you've got a photo of Nigel Farage, and underneath it you said uh, the claim. Uh, Nigel Farage says Malmo is the rape capital of Europe. And then underneath that, and you have to really have to start scrolling before you get to any of the details about why Malmo is not the rape capital of Europe. And I can't remember anything about it. I remember it wasn't true, but I can't remember anything about it, anything about why anybody would ever have thought it, anything about how rape statistics are gathered in Sweden or whether there was a, you know, he wanted to make a link with migration. I don't know whether there's a link with migration. I don't know anything about it. All I know is they over and over and over and over repeated the headline. Another thing fact checkers can get wrong is, um, in an attempt to add a little bit of sizzle, yeah, you've got uh, the, there's a fact checker in the U UK, uh, in the US that does uh, Pinocchios. They rate lies according to Pinocchios. I know why they do that. It's kind of fun. But actually, isn't there a little bit of name calling about it? Isn't it better to be as just play absolutely straight down the middle as much as you can? 
full fact in the UK, I think they're very, very good at being extremely neutral, not amplifying false claims, being very clear about what they do and don't know. Uh, the cost, of course, is that sometimes they seem a little bit dull, but I think they do amazing work. Um, and they also try to, to cut off misinformation at source. So, for example, if a fi the official statistics, there's a press release that is really confusing and people keep making mistakes, they'll say, well, hang on, every time you release this data set, people misinterpret it because you haven't explained it clearly. Or um, if a politician is repeating a claim uh, in... Uh, uh, well, a newspaper is repeating a claim, they'll get the newspaper to withdraw the claim, that sort of thing. Um, so there's, it's a really hard job, it's incredibly important, but I think over the last few years we've realised there's a lot, there's a lot to doing it really well. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, fact checkers themselves have to go through the same mental processes that you outline that we should be, you know, discerning and sceptical of statistics. I think last week there was actually a fact check on the Washington Post website, which I believe is the one that uses the Pinocchios, where Joe Biden had made a claim that, you know, almost all economists or all economists agree that uh, raising the minimum wage would be good for the economy. But in that uh, fact check, they didn't define how they were assessing the economy. You know, was it GDP they were thinking about? Was it um, mm -hmm. was it jobs? Um, was it economic welfare kind of broadly defined? You know, as fact checkers, you have to be careful to do that same defining what you're actually assessing before you assess the claim of the of the facts, it seems to me. Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to return to some of the uh, questions. Um, a few people have asked about whether you can talk about the, the dangers of kind of data mining and, and publication bias that have been um, so prominent in, in public discourse recently. And, and do you have any particular insights on that? Yeah, there's a whole chapter in the book about that. And uh, it, it, my interest in this really started when I saw this, uh, this famous study of uh, uh, choice of, of jam. So these two psychologists, very respected psychologists, set up this study where uh, in a high-end supermarket, they had this stall where they'd, they'd offer people jam and they could taste the jam and then they could get a voucher, which they could then grab some jam and they, the voucher would give them money off. So that the vouchers were enabling them to track whether people were buying jam or not. And some days they showed up with uh, a display of six speciality jams. And some days they showed up with a display of 24 speciality jams. And the surprising result was that uh, on the days when people saw more, more choice of jam, they actually bought less jam. Uh, and this became known as the, the choice demotivates effect or the choice is bad effect or sometimes the paradox of, uh, paradox of choice effect. And it went, just went huge. NPR did stuff on it. There's books published about it, TED Talks. And um, as an economist, I thought to myself, well, uh, well, economic theory says that that shouldn't happen. But economic theory is sometimes wrong. So, but, but what I'm worried about or what I'm puzzled about is I think Starbucks last time I looked, were boasting of selling 85,000 different combinations of drink. And Starbucks seemed to be doing fine. And if you go into a, you know, a Whole Foods or you go into a Walmart or, you know, it's just it's full of stuff. I mean, there's loads of stuff. Why, why, why is there so much choice it offered by very successful businesses? Oh, okay, well, this is, this is puzzling. And I, I talked to a psychologist about this and he said, you need to talk to Benjamin Scheiberhenner. Who is Benjamin Scheiberhenner? Well, Benjamin Scheiberhenner is a young, um, I think Swiss uh, psychologist who had wanted to, he'd had the same question as me. And he thought, well, I guess there must be something in the way the choices in something, something like Starbucks or Whole Foods, something about the way they're structured that means people aren't overwhelmed by them. So let me look at that and try and understand what it is about the way information is given that stops people be, being overwhelmed by choice. So he thought, I'll just repeat the experiment and then I'll start making modifications to explore it. But when he repeated the experiment, he didn't get the same result at all. And actually, when you look at the original data in the first experiment, the, the thing that really stands out is 30% of people bought jam when they saw six jams. 3% of people bought jam when they saw 24 jams. So actually, by being shown fewer jams, 10 times more people bought jam, really? 
can it be that big? Or, or is it a statistical fluke? But Benjamin Scheiber-Henner couldn't publish his results because who's interested in a result that says, eh, well, we showed, you know, we gave people more choice of jam and didn't really make any difference to anything, kind of what, what economic theory would suggest. And he said, well, maybe we can publish the, this is a replication, but most journals aren't in, interested in publishing replications. In the end, he put the word out and he found out that there were dozens of psychologists who had done this. Um, they found a big variety of results. Some agreed with the original paper. Some found the absolute opposite result. The biggest, most careful studies were kind of in the middle and found doesn't really make much difference how much speciality jam you offer or whatever it is. Sometimes it's chocolate, sometimes there's all kinds of different variants. Um, but none of these things have been published. So in the end, Scheiberhenner managed to publish this meta-analysis of all of these different unpublished studies. And the one study out there that had got all the attention and say, well, hang on, when you look at all the studies unpublished and published, you conclude that the average effect is probably zero, which is probably about what you'd expect, roughly what you'd expect from economic theory and the sort of thing you might expect just looking around. Um, that's publication bias. And that, there my journey into this story uh, began. It's such a fascinating issue. There are no easy fixes. It's very easy to talk about particularly psychology, but other sciences as being you know, riven with fraud and bad faith. But a lot of this is just uh, a system with not very good incentives. And I think the good news is the incentives are getting better, particularly in medical research. But publication bias is a serious issue and it is absolutely everywhere. And it's really, really hard to get away from it. So, um, you know, I mean, I t at the beginning of this talk, I told you the story about the art critic who was fooled by the crude forgery. I didn't tell you the story about the art critic who wasn't fooled by the, cr the crude forgery. It is everywhere. And we do what we can. Yeah, I think that's that, that's right, Tim. Though I do worry sometimes that I see some people just dismissing results out of hand, presuming uh, publication bias. So we should we should be careful um, not to take it too far, be discerning and skeptical, but uh, not dismissive. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a really important point, Ryan, and, and sorry to interrupt, but I mean, the, one of the central claims I'm making in my book is we keep telling people to be more skeptical. Actually, people have got that message over and over and over again. And we've got to a point where large numbers of people are willing to dismiss very well-sourced reports by very reputable journalists, very reputable outlets, uh, ignore uh, the consensus of large numbers of scientists. And basically, we got to a point where a lot of people would just go, I don't need to pay attention to any of this. I don't need to pay attention to any of it. It's all lies, damn lies, and statistics. It's all fake news. And I really think that gets us to a dangerous place. So yes, we need to be skeptical, but the skepticism needs to be healthy, and it needs to be proportionate rather than this, this sort of toxic, cynical dismissal of anything on the grounds that, well, you know, sometimes people lie and therefore I will never believe anything anybody ever says again unless it happens to coincide with my preconceptions. That's a dangerous place. And that's, that's you know, a real motivator for what I'm trying to do in the book. So when you think about, there's so many great books out there written about statistics, but think about the titles. How to Lie with Statistics, Bad Science, Field Guide to Lies and Statistics, Innumeracy. I mean, you see the pattern? Uh, I, I think there is a more, um, a more balanced, dare I even say, a more positive portrayal of the insights that we gain from statistics to, to be made. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do in The Data Detective. That's brilliantly put. Um... We've got about five minutes left, so I'm going to try to get through three more questions uh, pretty swiftly. So there's two from Nirav that I'm going to join together here. Um, and they're really, you know, what do we do in certain situations where the three C's might not be available or enough? So, you know, at the start of COVID, for example, we didn't have a lot of context to the numbers that were coming out. Uh, that obviously makes things more difficult. And quite often, um, advanced statistical methods are not particularly accessible to lay people. So, you know, are there are there more specific things we can do when, you know, either the one of the C's, you know, is is not there for whatever reason. We don't have context because it's a completely new issue, or the statistics are being produced in such a way that it's quite difficult for us as individuals to to kind of understand them. Mm -hmm. 
It's a great question. And I think in a nutshell, the answer is you need to find help. And the wonderful thing about the world today is while we are bombarded with um, misinformation and context-free claims on social media and all kinds of nonsense and noise and uh, abuse and all of that, we all know about that. It's also never been easier to find uh, informed people on any subject who will lay out the evidence in a, in a straightforward way and link to sources. And you can, you can find out what we know and what we don't know. So early on, for example, in the pandemic, I spoke to an epidemiologist who was, who was able to, I think, pin down a lot of the key issues. She was able to explain, you know, the data seemed to suggest that the fatality rate of this thing is 20%. That's not, you know, that is not actually the case. Here's why you might think it's 20% looking at the data. We actually think the fatality rate is closer to between half and 1%. I mean, that turns out to be really quite a good estimate of the infection fatality rate of, of the virus. She also said the real problem is not that it's incredibly dangerous. The real problem is it seems to spread very, very easily. Um, that's the real issue. And she was right about that. And that conversation was almost exactly a year ago. Uh, so if you talk to the right people um, and they're, you know, they're out there, they're being interviewed by responsible journalists, they're out there on Twitter, epidemiology Twitter is a marvellous thing, uh, they're writing blog posts, uh, medium posts, they'll be in reputable newspapers, you can get help, you can get context from people who understand and I think that's reliable. And a really good, just a straightforward thing to ask yourself is, remember the three C's, calm, context, curiosity? Is this person giving me information in a calm way? Are they helping me be calm? Are they giving me context? Are they helping me understand the uncertainties? And are they satisfying my curiosity? Are they telling me things about the world or are they trying to persuade me of something? So the three C's help even when you're kind of you're outsourcing the actual analysis to somebody else. I've got a great question here from Dave Patty, who, uh, you know, ask what do you think of opinion polls in all this you know quite often you might go onto a website and see 80 percent of people support medicare for all what what do you make of opinion polls and how do they fit into your story sure so uh so you, opinion polls can be incredibly bad i mean you can just have a you can select the sample however you like so you know the cato institute could publish an opinion poll saying you know, 98% of people are in favor of uh, liberty and peace. Um, well, how, well, how do you know? Well, we just polled people who donate money to the Cato Institute, which stands for liberty and peace. I mean, <laughs> so just pick your sample and you get the result you like. Um, so that's one way in which they can go wrong. But even when they're very well done, um, it's a really hard problem. So if you think about the problem of forecasting the presidential election, you might be calling, and I, I'll have the individual numbers wrong, but the principles is correct. You might be calling 50,000 people to get one or 2,000 people to actually answer your questions. And then you have to say, okay, the 48,000 people I called who, who didn't pick up the phone or who wouldn't answer my question, are they, are they well represented by the one or 2,000 people who did? And the problem is not the sample size. The problem is not that 2,000 is not enough and we should have talked to 5,000. That's not the issue. The issue is that the people who will talk to you might not be the same as the people who won't talk to you. And opinion pollsters know this, but what can they do about it? And they, can, they can try and make all kinds of ad hoc corrections, but they don't know. So what you get is pretty good results when the, resu when the result is not dependent on fine margins and when you have a good, you've got good historical context. But if the result is dependent on fine margins, or for, for some reason, history is not a great guide, the pollsters will make mistakes. And that will always be true. Yeah, definitely uh, a good health warning to have when looking at uh, opinion polls. I'm going to um, kind of riff off a question from um, Bert Ely here with, with something that I've been thinking about reading your book too. Um, there are a lot of government statistical agencies um, out there. And quite often their findings are kind of reported as fact. We had a CBO report out last week on the minimum wage, which, um, you know, is, is, has been reported as kind of as if it's the eternal truth on, on minimum wage policy of, of raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, now, famously, uh, John Cowperthwaite, the financial secretary in, in Hong Kong, said the problem is, you know, 
and I am paraphrasing and probably butchering what he actually said, is that when you measure something or have government measure something, then they usually plan for it. So uh, government statistics and their existence can lead to a tendency for people to set targets and, and try to plan to achieve things which can harm uh, the economy and society in a whole number of other unseen ways. Why as libertarians, because you're quite uh, kind of supportive of the role of government statistical agencies in the book, why should libertarians uh, buy that kind of supportive argument? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, let, let me make a partial defense of the CBO uh, to start with. So we, we, there is a study reported in the book just looks at the history of CBO forecasts and what they what they find is systematically the President's Council of Economic Advisors, if I remember rightly, or a more uh, partisan source of economic information, uh, routinely forecasts in a way that suits the, pres the, the, the prejudices of the president's party. So uh, Democrats tend to uh, forecast high, inf uh, high unemployment. Uh, Republican CEAs tend to forecast high inflation. Um, the Congressional Budget Office is, is much more neutral in its forecasts relative to the outturn. Um, and therefore tends to be more accurate. They make mistakes, but they're not systematic mistakes. Whereas you can see there's a systematic mistake in the forecast coming out of the, uh, the, you know, the Council of Economic Advisors. So you know, there's a role, I think, for neutral forecasting, independent forecasting, even if they will make mistakes. Of course they will. Um, I think if you believed in a world where government should do nothing and will do nothing, you could still make a case for gathering statistics, for everyone getting together to fund communally provided statistics, because all kinds of private businesses depend on official statistics. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff can't be gathered except by a big collective effort. Um, but the truth is, we don't live in a world where governments do nothing. We're not likely to live in a world where governments do nothing. Uh, the median voter doesn't want government to do nothing. So if we accept that governments will do things, then there's a further case for good, solid government statistics because you've got this giant, which could be either clumsily uh, blundering around and making mistakes, but at least able to see, or the giant could be blundering around, clumsily making mistakes and unable to see anything. My final defense of government statistics is look at who wants to suppress them. So who puts official statisticians in prison? So the populists in charge of Argentina, uh, the uh, chief statistician of Greece, a, a, a fragile democracy, uh, threatened with treason for telling the truth about Greece's deficit to uh, the European Statistical Agency. Or if you want to go more extreme, um, Joseph Stalin just used to shoot his chief statisticians uh, because they gave, gave him news that he didn't, didn't want. So I know there's a, there's a sense out there that or oh, maybe statistics will be used by the state to uh, oppress people the evidence is the contrary. States are well capable of pressing people if they want to without any data. They do it anyway. And free societies tend to uh, uphold the gathering of reliable data, which is valuable for all of us and helps the government make uh, decisions that are far less likely to be harmful. Well, Tim, thank you for being the voice of reason in a, uh, you know, a febrile world. I would urge people to... Uh, Go and buy the book. It's available in um, all good all good bookstores and uh, all the the standard online channels um, are, are selling it. Uh, Tim, if this was uh, an in person event, this would be the stage where I'd be asking the the audience to to thank you in the usual way with a round of applause. But absent that, uh, thank you on the behalf of the Cato Institute for being with us today. It's been a, a great event. I'm very very sorry to all of the other people that ask questions who I'm unable to get to. Just simply ran out of time. Thank you for your participation uh, and have a great rest of the day.